Welcome. This is Calibration and Data Handling with Stella. I'm Bob Everline, co-president at IC Systems, and I want to thank you all for joining me. So we've got quite a bit of material to cover today, so I'm going to go through um, some of it fairly quickly, and hopefully there will be enough material um, we'll be sending across, the models and the slides, obviously, that you'll be able to work through some of that if you've uh, found it interesting but have not had a chance to, to really follow the presentation. Uh, before we get started, just a couple words about webinar mechanics. Um, there's a grab tab um, that opens up and it allows you to open or close the display panel for what's going on. Um, and then the display panel, the most important part of that, well, there are two important parts. One is the audio setup. And unfortunately, if the audio is not working, you're not going to be able to hear this instruction. But that allows you to test which um, what you're hearing from and you can change the output source so if you have difficulty hearing it maybe that you can change the output source and hear it and then questions so you can submit questions anytime during the webinar or comments or issues that have popped up and um, we will be able to uh, respond to those and then the questions that are um, uh, related to the content of the webinar there are a couple question sections during the presentation and i'll be uh, discussing those during the those question sessions. So today's topic, as I say, there's quite a bit to cover. I want to give a broad perspective on data, um, as it's one of the most important things relative to calibration, clearly. And I'm going to actually begin with looking at importing parameters and graphical function values, kind of the basics behind getting data into models, then exporting results, importing time varying values as controls and as runs. And that first part, I'm going to move through fairly quickly. There are several example models that we will be sharing after the webinar that will allow you to work through what's within those. And then um, we'll pause for some questions about just managing data and dealing with data in Stella uh, in general. And then I'll go on to the section on calibration, which is taking the data and bringing it up against the model, making a comparison, defining payoffs, and controlling the calibration, and then we'll look at confidence bounds and the parameters that are estimated during calibration. And then there will be some summary observations and a final question and answer session. So this is one of my favorite diagrams. Anytime I talk about data, I do like to give this perspective on data. So this is, the, this is actually a diagram that Jay Forrester developed, and he developed it because he said, you know, people keep talking about getting the numbers right. But if you think about it, where's our knowledge about the way the world works? It's not sitting in numbers so much. It's sitting in a lot of things that are written down, not as numbers, but as um, texts and various types of oration. And more importantly, there's this huge mental database of the way that the real world works that we almost never write down, that we, um, if you allow the, to use the term intuit, and see how things are going on around us. And all of these basis data sources, if you will, are the basis for doing things. And the kind of top level one, I've got cause and effect, robustness, and operational thinking. That's how we go about building models. And then there are reference modes and comparative graphs that allow us to say, how do models relate to behavior? And then out of the numeric debase, database, we do get constants and graphicals for initialization and parameterization, and of course, time series for uh, data drivers and calibration. And we'll be talking about all of those today. But I want to give some background on importing parameters. Uh, we put parameters and initial values into equations. Obviously, lots of things are numbers. Often, those numbers are definitional. There are units conversions. Um, and units conversions are normally not things that would be imported. But there are also derived values, which might come out of theory or out of measurement. And importing allows all of those derived values to be put together in one place. Or if there are se several sections of them, like assumptions, to put together in a single place. And then there are assumed values, which are typically used for um, controlling scenarios or experiments. And it allows importing, allows easy organization for different assumption sets. You might have a series of scenarios you want to run. And having them uh, organized by scenario would allow, allow you to import them and then use them that way. And this will mostly be showing examples of just numbers, but graphicals, which are xy pairs, are another type of number that can be imported. And typically, those are some kind of derived um, relationship, often a relationship between an input and output of some sort. Time can also be the x-axis in graphicals, um, which would allow you to import time-varying parameters. But there's another technique, which I will really be focusing on here, for bringing in time-varying parameters. 
So I want to go through the mechanics of importing. Um, the process is the same, regardless if we're talking about definitional or derived values. Um, we build the model first. Um, typically, we have to do that. And then there's some organization of the content. And the content can be organized either as Excel files or CSV files. And I want to open up a, an example of Excel files. I'm mostly going to be showing Excel files today because the um, um, they're just the easiest, the easiest to look at, but uh, CSV files work in the same way. One of the files, actually, I will show you is a CSV file that will be open in Excel. And here is an example we have, in this case, in the first uh, column, we have a list of variable names within the model. And these are variables with uh, arrays, and um, the variable names are, this isn't a model that makes sense. It's got names that are meant to kind of indicate how they're being used. So I have arrayed constant element um, and it's red round material is a array range so it's got four values um, you can use a star instead of material in that um, constant element is just a single value this is from the same array but there's a single value in this case so it's a fairly flexible format in terms of what you've got similar to the way you write an equation for things um, and then there's a, a conveyor and the conveyor has a special property you can initialize it by time by giving it a common set the limited set of values which is which is done here and then graphicals which um, are most effectively introduced in importing using colon x and colon y notation where the x is the x-axis the y is the y-axis and so these are all pairs of numbers zero and four one and three and so on um, and then there are just a regular constant, some other things. And if we go to the model now, we see that um, those imported values will show up with a X. And the way those are imported, I'll just quickly go back to the PowerPoint. Um, just a note on the um, nature of the setup of the import parameters. So there's one value for a parameter. If it's an array slice, we call it, when there are multiple values for material, as the example we showed. Uh, each one is an array element, so there are a number of different values. And then graphicals, of course, are XY pairs, so they're a sequence of different values. Now, in order to bring those into a model, what we need to do is go to the model, import data, and this is all set up, imported. We give it the name of the uh, file, which is a spreadsheet, the tab on the file, which is it's going to be import, what we want to do with it, and this will be um, setting the parameters, which means that we're actually going to take the values that are in the spreadsheet and change the equations to reflect those values. And then whether it's dynamic or on demand, dynamic means that every time that file changes, the new values will be imported. Um, and so we will get the new values always when we're working with the model. And so if we run this model, all of those values then end up being the things that are driving this um, thing. For example, the arrayed XY graphical, um, and actually something you can just see a slice of, are all driven by the uh, source from the spreadsheet. So what do we do? Um, and okay, yes, conditions under which they were read. We went over that. So model simulations, um, let me just say a couple more things about the importing process because there are different options for that. Um, if we were to import data um, from not the import sheet, but from a sheet I called control, which going back to the spreadsheet, the control tab looks almost the same as the import tab, except that instead of the one comma two and so on, separating the um, values for the initialization of the array, they're simply initialized by the total value. You're, you cannot use that initialization format for um, control values. And so if we were to actually try to take the control and set the parameters, we would get a warning, an error message. It can't do anything because there are equations in the model that have one comma two comma three, and we can't set those to a constant. Um, but if we went to control value, variables, um, we can do that. And in addition, control variables allows you to control things that are computed equations. So when you're importing to set equations, you can only set constants, but if controlling it, you can control e importing equations. And that allows you to have um, 
specification over what will run, and those values will be used throughout the simulation, but the underlying equations will be left the way they originally were. There will be no change in them. Exporting results is um, the opposite of importing, and the reason I want to bring it up mostly is so we can look at the format of the exported result. So if we go and open up, I'll close this file, and I'm going to open up an export file, export 01, and it's actually the same model pretty much, and it's got imported values just like the previous model does, but in addition to that, it has some exported values, exported data. So I've said three different kinds of things I want to export. One is all values, which means everything that's computed in the model. So that's selected here. One is um, parameter values, which means um, values of constants um, that are in the model. And then there's a final one, which is a table. It's an example table where it exports the content of the table. And if we go and look at the spreadsheet export, this is import 01, we find export 01. Um, right now, you'll see that the uh, content of those tabs in that spreadsheet is blank. When I run this model, each time I run the model, there's also a button to do it immediately, but when I run this model, it will go through the export process. You saw a little current thing on the uh, side here indicating that it was working. And now if we look at the content of the um, spreadsheets, each of these has been filled in. So all values is everything that's computed for all the variables in the model. Parameter values are just the things that are constants in the model, which are generally the things we've been importing, although we didn't import all of them. The table example really is just the content of that specific table, which is a relatively small table with not that much in it. Um, and then there's also something called control parameters, which you actually get by exporting, which is something that's handy to know, under window, there's a open parameter control panel, and that shows you all of the variables that are being controlled, either through this import process or possibly because you've spun a knob, for example, that would change. You can see now it's changing the arrayed constant slice to that. Um, and you can put as save as an import sheet. And if I were to select export 01, um, it will give me controlled PARMs because the other sheets are already in use. Horizontal is um, the format. It's just a little bit easier to use that, as I mentioned, to look at um, in this kind of a setting. And then you can see that the control values are now shown. And somewhere I wish it would have had a little number, which I don't see offhand, um, that shows that. But those are all the values that were in that control parameter window. So that's the process for exporting results. Um, and the key thing about the exporting results is the, I'm picking the wrong spreadsheet, which doesn't help. Um, there's control parameters, and there's the little knob that I, um, I, that I twisted. So the key thing is, and this didn't, let me just run it again. I thought I saw this fill in, but I may have been wrong. Um, the key thing here is the format, and the format is the time. If you use the units of measure for the time, it's a label for that going across the top here, including going down the first row, and then it has the values for everything below that. And that's the same format that we will use when we want to import values that are not a single number, but a number that varies across time. We call them time-varying imports. So time-varying values, that will be import 0, 2, can be used for a number of different reasons. One is that they can, well, really two fundamental reasons. One is driving variables, which is to say that the variable will be used to compute the values of it and the variables that derive from it within the model. And that's a variation of the import parameter process where the parameter is telling you what value is for an equation. This is telling you what the values is are for an equation, but they're changing over time. And this is a little, this is more compact and somewhat more flexible than the graphical imports, which is another way of doing it, where the time axis, the x-axis is time. And missing values are fine in this thing, um, in this format, and it also has some additional interpolation options, which we'll look at in this example. And so let me actually go, first I'll show you the, um, 
can go to I'll show you the import sheets, which are terribly, terribly simple because I've got one. These are the different uh, interpolation formats for the tabs here. And you'll notice that we have exactly the same numbers, except for different names for all of these different tabs. And the reason is just to show you the different ways that interpolation works within the model. So I'm going to close export 02 and open up import 02. And here we have the imported values. If I go to model, import data, it's exactly the same format as what we saw before, except now at the bottom, it says time varying values. And if we look at each of these, we'll see that we have different selections for the time varying values where the selections essentially match the name of the uh, worksheet, uh, just for convenience, obviously. If I run this model, the interesting thing is that the values, which are, you can see them kind of here, 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 a total of uh, six values being shown. Before you get to the values, what happens depends upon the interpolation mode. So the red line here, which is the extrapolate mode, um, takes the last two values, sends them linearly downward, the first two values linearly backwards. You can zoom in a little bit on this to, going to show a bit more of it. Before it gets started, though, what happens? Well, in the continuous case, what it does is it takes the first value, and it just keeps that value till it gets to it. And then it goes and it does a linear interpolation between the values, linear interpolation. Then it takes the last value, and it will continue on to the last value. The um, backwards or forwards, which are in, the discrete option in the graphical is the backwards version, and then there's a forward version. Look at the data point you've got. If you've got a data point, it reports it. If you don't have a data point, backwards said, well, what was the last data point? Keep reporting that. So it just stays constant at the last data point, and then it jumps, and then it stays constant, and it jumps. Whereas forwards um, says, do I have a data point? No. What's the next data point? It jumps to the next data point, jumps to the next data point, jumps to the next data point. Outside of the range, those are going to be the same because the first and the last data point are the same. There's something called raw, which allows you to use the computed value in the model everywhere in between. This computed value in the model is always one. So we get this one everywhere except where there's actually a data point where it shows the value of the data point. And then there's something called inside, which I'm going to show a little bit um, extended example in the next, the next model that I show. So um, the other way we can bring values in, in terms of importing time varying values, is through the data manager. And it's uh, fairly straightforward. It, we say load external data as run. We browse for that external data. So this is import 02. Um, we look for the sheet. The other sheets are in use. So it's given us just the last sheet, which is not in use. It's called as run. And when we do that, we will get an unrecognized variable name forward. This is really just to show you what kinds of messages show up. If you, it goes through and tries to determine what all the variables are within the model, and it gives you a message if it can't find one of them. In this case, it should have had an S on it. It should have been four words. Um, so we won't have any values for that. But now if I were to look at something like interpolate and do a view results for it, I will get a comparison of the model and the data that I've loaded in, and those two are identical because the default mode is interpolation, and when you bring the data in, we interpolate it. But you'll notice that the import 02, if you look at the table, only has values at the points where it actually had numbers. It doesn't have any in between. It is the graph, actually, that does the interpolation in this case. And if I were to look at something like um, the backwards, uh, values are the same, so we're actually seeing the interpolation on the thing that's in the data set. But of course, backwards is a stepwise thing, so it doesn't behave the same as the imported values. The, um, again, we only see values at the points where there are numbers in the imported data set. So that is the two ways of bringing the data into the model. Um, both of these can actually be used for calibration. So we will be using the second one where we bring in the data as a run.
but you can also specify that the values be used, which are control values. And in this case, the payoff definition takes care of the data points. I'll get to this when we talk about calibration, but it's very important that you only compare data points, not the interpolation of the data points uh, when you're doing the calibration. So I want to talk about the inside option, if you will, transition to computed values, because this is a nice example of how you can use imported driving variables to uh, work with a model um, doing um, different kinds of things, both on the interface and on the model layer, although the interface is probably more interesting in this particular case. So let me open up the projections model. And here we have um, projections is just a little um, sort of office stock model where you build an office, you have enough office space, then you stop building and whatnot. And this is set up um, so that with a pause interval, so that as we move along, I've got um, starting is, and you can barely see it, let me stop it and reset it. You can see that starting is an imported value can't really see it because of the way it's drawing right now. There, now you can see it. Starting as an imported value, it's got the little import symbol associated with it. And what that means is that, and it's imported using the inside option. And what that means is that when it runs out of data, which it will actually at about 2015, so if I go to projections, we see, sorry, at 2019, we have data for 2015 through 2019, and then starting after 2019, we run out of data. So it's gonna use these values up to 2019. After that, it'll use the computed value. And the computed value in this case is really a computed value. Um, it's a stock correction value. And so if we simulate this model, the first few times we're using whatever was imported in terms of what we get, and then there's going to be a divergence where, um, what's imported is not the same thing as the, uh, well, we're using the starting, sorry, the starting value would have been, this is what's computed and showing in the blue, um, what's the starting value is how much we're using, the computed showing in the dash red is how much we would use, except the model is not using that until we run out of data, at which point the model starts using that and it uses that value going forward. And so that's uh, on the model layer, so it's a little more interesting on the interface layer. We can set up an interface have it work, I'm gonna start over, start it. When I click on go, it will do, this is set up with a lead in time, um, which means that it'll compute the first five years automatically before it actually gets started. And during those first five years, it will read in the imported values. And after that, it will either use what I override or the computed value as I go forward. So if I step forward, this would be the same thing as we did before, or if I want to, um, change that myself and try and control it, I can do that myself. And this allows you to set up a uh, game or other activity and let people use that where the initial harsh portion of the simulation is already predefined and then they pick up from that. So those are really the different ways of bringing data into the model. I wanted to pause at this point and ask if there are questions about um, how we might be bringing in data or anything I've shown you so far. And there are some links here for um, some of the information I covered in the help file. It's great, Bob. Um, so far, there are no questions that anyone has entered, but I think there are two things if you could quickly review um, how you import um, the time varying data, the, the, how you set those different check boxes just very quickly. I know you showed it for the inside, but just quickly review that um for everyone and then Absolutely. the other one would be to the other one would be to talk about when data actually gets imported when it's dynamic okay so let me go back to the import 02 which had a variety of different choices on the interpolation modes um, so import data when we set the load time varying we can set the type that it is and actually there are some tool tips for these that because they're relatively short names, there are some tool tips for these that explain what, what happens um, with each of them. But basically you just check that. And there is, I'm not gonna go into it here, but if you look at the documentation, there's actually a way to override individual import elements to, to have specific time varying formats, even when the file itself is being used as a different time varying format. And then the 
second question um, you just asked was when the import process takes place, and it depends upon um, what type of import, I should have left that window open, what type of import it is. If it's a um, set parameter import, then the data are imported, as long as the um, dynamic is checked. If it's set parameters, data are imported anytime the source file changes. So the source file is continually looked at to see whether or not it's changed. If you make a save, you save it. So the timestamp changes, then that will be re-imported and the equations will be set. When it's a control parameters, they're imported just before the model is run. Um, so, because it doesn't change any equations or anything, it's only the values in the run that are going to be changed. So that's imported just before the model is run. And then load time varying behaves the same way. It's imported just before the model is run. Great. Thank you, Bob. There's a, another question. Can you explain what the advantage of using spreadsheets is compared to having the data in the model only? So um, a lot of the advantage in spreadsheets is organizational. All of the information can be put in one spot. Um, if you're using the uh, set parameters, it ends up in the, in the model anyway. And then the data uh, in the spreadsheet, in fact, in that case, you might want to use the on-demand. It's just really an organizing it spatial and convenience thing at that point. Um, if you've got one, you know, three or four parameters, it really doesn't make any difference. But when you have hundreds of parameters, it can make a big difference to organizing your work. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to I'll move on. We'll, we can get back to the other questions um, after we we go through the calibration part, it'll probably be good. So in calibration, I'm going to hopefully slow down a little bit and um, try and move through basically an extended example to show you how calibration works, giving you some of the conceptual frame. We don't really have time to go into all of the uh, detail um, about calibration. There is a, you know, statistical models underlying it and whatnot that I will allude to but not go into any detail on. But I want to give some kind of conceptual frame of what it is that calibration is why we do it and how we do it. So calibration is really um, the process of making a model representative of the system being modeled. And we do that by adjusting model parameters and in some cases structures so that behavior matches the data. So why would we do that? Well, there are two reasons for it. We're gonna show both of those in the example. One is face validity. Does this model look like it might have been able to generate the kind of behavior that we've observed in the real world? Because if it doesn't, then people are going to say, I don't get it. Why are you showing me this model? Um, face validity is very important. It's not rigorous, but it is an important mechanism for making sure that people can kind of relate to a model and figure out whether or not it's telling them something about the real world. And then the more important, the more rigorous reason is finding out what is wrong with the model. So calibration is really a process of theory rejection in the scientific sense where we go through and calibrate a model in order to make sure that the theories that underlie that model are things that we can not reject with some degree of confidence so that we do have some uh, confidence that the model is telling us something about the real world. So how do we do that? Well, we build the model with measured values being computed. So it is important when we build a model that the things in the model, some of the things in the model can be measured, certainly not all of them. Then we load it <coughs> time varying data on those values. <coughs> Define a ba payoff <coughs> based on comparison with the uh, values and optimize over the appropriate set of parameters. So the example I want to do is age infections of death. Um, this is example is a simple, it's called a BAS diffusion model, also often called an SIR model, although um, we are not going to have the R part in this, the model that we do. I'm going to actually show you the model. So this is a, <coughs> a model where there are uninfected at risk and infected. There's a contact process. That contact process can lead to infections, which gives you more people being infected. And the outflow from this, in this case, is deaths. <coughs> so <coughs> that's the BAS diffusion model. We do have some data on this from the CDC, um, fairly early data in the process. Here, um, it's basically coming out of some of the graphs that we did in the data collection process. 
And this is thousands of people starting in 1985, running through 2001. And it's the number of people becoming infected and the number of people dying of AIDS as is measured by the C CDC. So the first thing we want to talk about is face validity. Do we have face validity with this model? Well, let's go in and bring that data into the model. So I'm going to go, do it as we did before, open up the data manager, load external data as we run, select the data source, this is AIDS data. In this case, it's a text file, um, which is uh, tab delimited in this case. A CSV file would also work. So we don't need to tell it which sheet to come from because there's only one sheet. We simply say OK, and it just does it. And as soon as it does it, we'll see that the graphs for infections and deaths now show the values for the data. Now, if we run this model, how does that compare with the graphs? And the answer is not very well. If, if you didn't understand the structure of this model very well, you might say, gee, this model looks like it's going to give slow growth. And maybe we could adjust the growth up, but it's not going to give this kind of S-shaped behavior. And that's because of the parameter sets we've selected for this particular model. So the first thing we can say is, gee, this model doesn't look like the data. Let's reject the model. And that, of course, would be a mistake because we know that this structure is capable of generating behavior that does look like this data. So if we went through and we upped the contact rate, for example, now we're getting things that look a little bit more like what you might expect. Put that up about five, and then I can move this back and forth with the initial infected. Move that up about five. And now we've got a thing where, okay, you know, that's kind of infections look about right. Deaths look oddly high, um, although kind of similar in character. But it's like if I can get one of these to be close, shouldn't I be able to get the other one to be close? And now we ask ourselves, can we reject the model? Well, not on the face validity measure of the model. On face validity, it's, yeah, it's kind of similar behavior. We need to understand whether or not there's something structurally about the model that makes these numbers, the actual magnitude of the numbers, as different as they, they are here, or if it's something about the parameters of the model that we haven't adjusted yet. So uh, we set the contact rate and initial infected to good. Is it good enough? The answer really is no at this point. It's not quite good enough. So what do we do? Well, what we need to do is we need to make it as good as we can before we do that comparison again and say whether or not we can reject the model. So the, that's a process of optimization. It's very much like the process of optimization we talked about when we did the optimization webinar. First, define a payoff, define some parameters to optimize over, and run the optimization. So the payoff definition um, for calibration actually has a little bit more guidance than it does in the case of uh, policy optimization or outcome optimization. So there we were often looking at getting the components kind of in the same units of measurement, trying to get them in dollars, for example. Here we can fall back a little bit on statistical assumptions to talk about how we might want to have different values compared, because we have both infections and deaths here. In doing a payoff, we're going to want to include both of those in the payoff, and it would be good to figure out how to weight them. So uh, a important point, I'm going to go in and show you that in a second, but an important point in the calibration payoffs is they're based on comparison. And you should only make a comparison when their data points are there. So we're going to make comparisons only on the points where there are data. This particular model has a uh, time step or DT of 0.25, which means that we're getting four computations for every one year. The data are recorded only on a yearly basis. We don't have anything in between those. We only want to make a comparison when those data are available. So there are two built-in definitions for doing that, squared error and absolute error. And the squared error is uh, the one we'll be using in this case. It, it is consistent with a normal distribution assumption on uh, the errors that are being generated, which is fairly common in statistics um, and useful data models. And it allows a tolerance there's something else called the tolerance zone. I'll show you that in a second, which is a, a specialty use that we won't be going into. So let me go in and show you how we bring in a payoff for this. So we go to the calibration, which is the model analysis tools tab. We're in the payoff tab of that. And the first choice up here is outcome optimization or calibration. This will be a calibration, so we select that. 
another option that appears there. To automatically compute weights. I'll talk to that in the second example of that, actually. And we have two things that we want to compare. One is AIDS infection. And now since it's a calibration, we're making a comparison. We need to tell it which model variable to compare it to. This will typically be the same name as the model variable um, that we're comparing, but it does not have to be. And then what run do we want to compare it to? Well, we want to compare it to this run that we loaded that was called AIDS data. And then that's AIDS infections. We do a similar thing for AIDS death. Now, what I haven't done at this point is I haven't set a weight. Now, there's two ways to set weights. One is to let the software automatically compute them, which it does a fairly good job of. But I also kind of want to get some, a little bit of statistical background on how you might do that. And the way that might be done if we go to the AIDS data is a have a slide on this that kind of gives the formula for it. One over the variance of the expected error as the weight, which is a mouthful, obviously. But what it means is that if we expect to take some amount of error in computing a value, we can take the variance of that amount of error we expect to make and use one over that as the weight. Um, and typically, we do that using the data. Um, for those of you who are kind of more familiar with statistics, there's an underlying theoretical data generation model that is talked about, and it is the variance in that data generation model we want to get at. Since we don't know that model, we typically use the realized data, measured data, as the basis for doing that. And in the spreadsheet, there's a formula that I call square comp equal square comp P of, and I'll do some inspection here. Nope, I didn't quite do it right. Oops. Oh, now it's doing it to me. It's there dot p. That's why it's doing it to me. It doesn't like the total. Okay. And then we can do a similar thing for the uh, deaths. And then it's one over that, as I said. Could have done that in one step. I'll do it number two. And so we get about 0 0.003 and 0 0.005 in terms of the total on the slide. And so we're going to use as the weight then for AIDS infections, we're going to use a weight of 0 0.003. 0 .003. And for AIDS death, a weight of 0 0.005. So that's the specification of the payoff. Um, cell, as I say, can do some of this automatically doing a same sort of computation I just did. Um, and this definition has the advantage. It allows an interpretation of the payoff value, um, which should be approximately equal to the total number of data points across all the data series. This is a combining data series. Um, and that means that we have a mechanism for computing the confidence bounds on the data using um, the statistical characteristics, assuming a normal distribution. Um, we get the payoff itself becomes something like chi squared or one to the zero. Um, but we're not going to go into that level of detail for obvious reasons. And then what we do is we specify what parameters we want to optimize over. So things like the average risk tenure, and to do that, we go here. We go to the optimization tab. We bring in the average risk tenure, and we say that's between 0 0.1, I believe it was, and 10. And then we would add another parameter and do that. And rather than going through that and likely making mistakes doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up something where I've done that to it all. So this is the same model, but the things have been set up now. The payoff is the same, the same weights that we just showed. And the optimization has all the parameters in it, the average risk tenure, survival time, things like this, so on. And now it's up to us to do is click on the little O run button. Oh, the one other thing I should point out in this optimization is I set the maximum number of simulations to 25,000. This is a fairly large number of parameters we're optimizing over. So it actually does take quite a few simulations to converge. 
click on O-Run, it goes off and does things. And then it gives us some output. The optimization output is organized uh, to tell you kind of what it is you're doing, doing a Powell optimization, uh, what the payoff is. It's got two components, age infections and deaths, the weights for that, what we're comparing it to, where the data source is, what type of comparison. Then it's got the parameters, min, max, and then of course the bottom line, which is the results of the optimization, is what are the values for average risk on your at-risk population. At new at risk population initially infected, and then finally, of course, it shows the value of the payoff that was computed using those values. And we can look now at the results. Uh, AIDS infections are following along relatively good, but a little low. AIDS deaths are following along, again, relatively good, but a little bit high. So we've got one that's a little low <coughs> and one that's a little high, and that's kind of interesting. So the question is, can we reject this model? And I say that yes already, but perhaps we might want to do a little bit more experimenting before we figure out whether or not we can reject the model. Could we get a better fit on AIDS infections if we gave a little less weight to AIDS deaths and the payoff? And this is a kind of a useful exercise just in terms of the response you get. So I'm going to go to AIDS deaths. Instead of 0 0.005, I'm going to add an extra zero in there. I'm going to sort of weight it as a tenth. And I'm going to do an O run. And I'm not going to look at the parameters so much as the results. And the answer is, yeah, you get a pretty good fit for the infections. There's still a little bit of a jump up there, but that could be a lot of different things. But deaths, of course, are even further out than they were before, so a bit too high. And we could do the opposite experiment. We could say, what if I were to decrease the infections, but leave deaths where it used to be. So I put it back to 0 0.005, and then optimize over it. Um, again, we get an optimization. And then here we get a much better fit on deaths, uh, a much, much worse fit on infections. Um, we're only way low on infections. But there's something very interesting about the deaths here. <clears throat> Our model is producing a nice, smooth adjustment up and adjustment down on deaths. The data show a fairly smooth adjustment up, although it's not a little bit more linear than we might expect, but a very dramatic drop off going down. Our model, the structure in our model, is not capable of generating that dramatic drop off going down. And so this comparison of deaths is a good way to say, you know, there is some structure in the real world that must have been operating that we're not capturing in our model. And that is then a basis for rejecting the model. More importantly, um, it uh, kind of tells us where we might go in terms of refining the model. We've got this very steep drop off. What happened? What might have caused that? Well, for those of you who kind of know the history of this um, early, the early stages of the AIDS, this is 1997, around that time, 96, 97, when AIDS cocktails first became available, collections of drugs that could be used to um, prolong life and diminish the symptoms of those people dealing with uh, AIDS. So that kind of gives us a direction, not only that something's wrong here, but where we might correct the model. And calibration is important in that sense. That calibration helps us look for where we might find areas to improve our model in terms of its ability to represent what happened in the real system. Confidence bounds are a way of getting um, some amount of confidence in the um, parameter estimates that we've made. So I'm going to go back to the optimization and reset the weights to what they were before. So they're both um, the original values. And now in the optimization, I have an option to commute comp compute confidence bounds, which I can do as a statistical percent. And that says, I want to show e for each of these parameters, I want to know what the 95% confidence bounds is, which I, means that I'm 95% confidence bound, confident that it will be in this range. And now I click on O run. I will get essentially the same results in terms of behavior, the values that we had for the original one parameters. But now for each of these, I get a confidence bound. Um, or I don't get a confidence bound. So I, I do get a confidence bound. Right away. Um, and it says, for example, risk tenure between 3.8 and 4.6, which is a fairly broad range. The best value is computed at 
survival time of 0.25 to 0.26, very, very tight range. It says we're pretty confident that that can't be that much different. Contact rate, also pretty tight in terms of uh, our confidence of that. Initial at-risk population is a series of stars. The stars indicate that it was not able to figure out the confidence bounds. And what's happening here is that the initial at-risk population is actually, the optimization is not very sensitive to it. So these are, it's a very flat payoff surface in, uh, in terms of what it, how it responds to this particular parameter. And so it couldn't actually figure out anything, which means there are very wide confidence bounds. The new at-risk population, fairly wide bounds. Initial infected, also fairly wide bounds, but um, computed. So the grain of salt that I wanted to point out here is the following, and I'm going to do this just as a thought experiment. But for those of you who know this model, there are two parameters that control how fast the infection, the positive loop, how strong this positive loop is. One is the contact rate, and the other one is the infection percent. And if I were to double the infection percent and cut the contact rate in half, contacts would be twice as small, but infections would then multiply that by two, so we'd be back to where they were. The observable variables would be identical. And so our confidence bound on contact rate assumes that we know what the infection percent is. We don't actually know what the infection percent is, so contact rate, in a sense, can be any value at all which is why I say that you need to use confidence bounds with a grain of salt. You need to understand the underlying model and the data that the model is using in terms of what it's telling you about the way the, uh, the system works. Um, so the infection percent as a search parameter, I'm mentioning the same th thing here we did as a thought experiment. The results do not change because of narrow bounds, so we can't derive both the infection percent and the contact rate from just the data or studying the structure, we need to we need to we would need to get more information, and there is more information on that kind of thing, especially around the um, the infection percent that would be allow us to get a, a stronger value for that. I want to give one more example of confidence bounds. It's a little bit cleaner in the sense that obviously this AIDS model is nice in the sense that the model isn't so great relative to the data and its struggle, and that's actually very very typical for doing calibration. You're like, you're working with stuff, it never quite works, you gotta figure out what's wrong, and there's kind of an iterative process of going through that. But let me show you something where the model is, because it's a, it's a fake model, it was constructed to um, actually be relatively representative of what was happening in the data. Let me close out these two citations again right now. And this is just calibration confidence bounds. So this is a little model. If I run this model, I see I get kind of similar behavior, but we're way overshooting in terms of the initial quantity. And the question is, can we get uh, a calibration that will do things that will kind of make it look better? And the calibration here, payoff is just workforce and inventory. I've automatically computed weights, which means that um, Stella will go through and do that process that we went through in the spreadsheet, but it will do it against this first simulation here in terms of the error that's being generated. And then the optimization process, similar sort of thing. I've got two times I'm adjusting, and I'm asking it to compute confidence bounds. And I just do an O run. And now I get confidence bounds that are um, 3.0 to 3.25 and 2.7 to 2.85. Um, so they're fairly tight, but not super tight. Um, one thing that is worth noting here, we're automatically computing weights. This model now fits the data much better than it used to, which means that the expected variance of the errors is actually going to be quite a bit smaller. If I run this again and look at the confidence bounds, they're now 3.1 to 3.2 versus... Three point, well, they don't change that much, but they do change a little bit. And the reason they change is because the weights that are being used for the, uh, the payoff function have changed slightly because we have a better fit to the data than we had when we ran this the first time. And this is not atypical. If, you get a, uh, if you're doing automatically computed weights, it's often good to do at least one calibration first to get things kind of in the ballpark and then do it again because the weight computation will be different the second time. So some observations. Um, it's fun and easy to work with data. Um, it is actually fun and easy to work with data. It grounds the model assumptions and the results so you can kind of look at what you've got. 
Um, and it's important you pick measures that people can relate to. This is a, the model itself should be constructed of things that people can understand. The data that you're comparing it with should be things that people um, have some familiarity with, key rates, and, and think they're important. Behavior comparisons are a useful touchstone, but I want to emphasize again that they are not the only touchstone to be used in, val in looking at the quality of your model. Operational thinking, units checking, all that kind of stuff is really, really important. Um, calibration is the process of fitting a model to data, and ultimately its scientific purpose is to reject the model. The reason we calibrate is to reject the model. Validity, or really more precisely the value of a model, is a much, much broader question than simply calibration. Physics, common sense, measured numeric values, these are all things that need to go into looking at a, uh, the value of a model for answering particular questions and guiding policy. So thank you. Questions um, related to what I presented or to the earlier part of the data are welcome. Hey, Bob, we have a quick question on how do you set up the lead-in time? Um, so lead-in time, there is, um, it's on the interface. Uh, I'll grab it quickly. I obviously diverts a little bit from the uh, calibration context here, but um, it's a fun way to use data clearly. And uh, on the interface itself, in the control parameters, there is a little thing called a lead in time. And you just say, I'm going to, when I start a simulation, I want it to run to 2020 before anybody has any chance to interact with it. And the software will go through and run it as fast as it can to 2020. And so that every time somebody looks at something in the interface, it's either a blank graph showing things. You either get a blank graph or you get something that's got some amount of data filled in. You never get in a situation where it starts the beginning and goes up. So that's a great way of just kind of seeding the beginning of a run or showing if you've got like a prehistory, a history and a future section, you can do the lead in time for the history section and then you can only change the future going forward, which is the way the world works. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, is there any difference in approach when you calibrate to a flow instead of a stock? So that's a really, really good question. So stocks are accumulations of things. And in a sense, the point comparison of a stock at a, any point in time is exactly the thing that you want to be looking at. Typically, when we measure flows, we measure them by accumulating the value of the flow over the course of the year and then reporting the average value of that flow over the course of the year. And if you've got something where that level of detail is important, perhaps because the flows are changing, then you may actually want to go in and look at the flows as they're being computed and either set the times for those flows instead of to be the same as the time for the stock, to be the half year prior to the time for the stock. So you get some more alignment there. In many cases, if it's a fairly smooth set of transition, it doesn't make that much difference, but it is something that you end up worrying about a lot if you're getting into the fine details. Thank you. Uh, next question, is there any rule of thumb or guidance for how many variables should be calibrated? Um, the rule of thumb is is really a handful. So five is a is a pretty decent number. I have done situations where I've done twenty five to thirty, um, and it's it's a legitimate exercise, especially if there's a fair bit of separ separability in the structure of the model to get look at different things. But with that much separability, it's also possible to kind of break the calibration process up into stages where each of the stages is using four or five parameters. Really depends upon. Uh, what you're trying to accomplish. Typically, there are two to three parameters that are really key in any calibration. And in terms of presenting it to people and talking about confidence rounds and things like that, having a small handful only is, is very helpful. Next question. Say I have a time series of five years in my data set. I want to calibrate only in the first three years and see the calibrated model parameters against the natural state of the system. Is there a way to set this up? So the, um, there are several ways to set it up. One way is to do a calibration where the time specs of the model are running only to the, during the historical period, and then simply change the time specs of the model after that to go out a little bit further. 
The other way would be to truncate the data in the data source being used for calibration and use a different data source for comparison. Um, so you could do that, for example, using the uh, the values, the computed values uh, approach that I that I talked about, where we instead of using uh, loading the variables, you um, specify them as an import and then use the values there. But that would be essentially the same data source. What one of them would be truncated relative to the other one. Okay, how can you set this up so that the uh, payoff, it says criterion, but I assume it's payoff, um, if the data is in a different model variable than the one that you're using? So in the payoff definition itself, back to page 03. Um, if I looked at AIDS infections, I could pick any variable to compare it against. And suppose I had something called AIDS infections da data, which I don't, but I'll pretend as a drift tenure as that. I'd say use AIDS infection data. Well, let me put some in. It's not too, so confusing. Let me just put AIDS infection data here. All right, now let me go back and I'll do this not quite the right way because I'm actually not running the data in, but I'm going to compare that to AIDS infection data. And I'm going to say that I want to do that from the current run. And then I'm going to go through and set up an import link to AIDS infection data and for the current run, which would actually be the same as AIDS infection would be. And what it will do is it will make a comparison of that to the current run. That's using data. I don't actually have to use data. This could be a computed value. I could compare this to 66. Um, which is what this would happen. Would, this payoff would do right now. It'd try and get 66 as AIDS infections. I think that was the right value for it. And that computed value could be used in a kind of a specialized case. What we're trying to do is calibrate one section of a model relative to another section of the model. You might have more detail or less detail or something, and you're trying to calibrate that. So you could also use it in that form. It's pretty flexible that way. Thank you. And then there's a fairly general question about how do you defend the choice of weights that you use in your payoff? So as I say, there's a statistical basis for that. And those of you who've worked with statistical models know that there's always a lot of assumptions. Those assumptions are rarely realized in real life. Um, but that statistical basis is the mechanism by which it's defended. So we really need to say that it's reasonable, if not correct, to assume that there's some amount of normality in the error distribution of the distribution of values that are generating these errors and that the sample um, variance that we can measure using the uh, realized values of all of our data is a good approximation to the underlying population variance and therefore is a reasonable um, value to use in a weight. It really comes back to statistical uh, assumptions that are being made and um, those are reasonable. We know they're always wrong, um, but they really are the basis for defending the, the choice of weights. Great. Thank you, Bob. That's it. Oh, wait, wait right. one more just came in. Okay. If I use the confidence intervals in a paper, what is the correct name for the method? Um, it's, it's a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom, so it's really a chi-squared test. Great. Thank you. All right. So thank you all um, for attending this webinar. We have a couple upcoming webinars. The next one is scheduled uh, a little less than a month from now, building multiplayer games with the rays and wildcards. And then using Stella to trace causality, um, we haven't scheduled these yet, but we'll be held in the future. Um, appreciate it. As always, um, if you want to get in touch with us, any questions or whatnot, support at icsystems.com. If you want to send me a note, feel, please, please feel free to do so. Be ever line at icsystems.com. Um, happy to uh, answer additional questions that you might have. Thank you so much. <laughs>